You landed on The Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us every other week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, and hope you guys are doing well here. Um, those of you new to The Substance here, we are a Christian variety show podcast, meaning from week to week we have different formats, different types of guests. You're not going to only get one thing here on The Substance. Um, previous guests include folks like Karen Swallow Pryor, Jamar Tisby, Robert P. Jones, uh, Josh Larson of Film Spotting, and recording artist Propaganda. Um, you can go back in the library, check out some of those episodes. We've got a lot of great folks there. And today I'm very excited to share with you my episode with Jonna Harris. Jonna is somebody who I have been connected with for the last few years now. She runs a podcast that is really good and really difficult. It's called The Bodies Behind the Bus. Many of you may be aware of it, or maybe you haven't listened to the show before. You recognize the phrase from the infamous uh, Mark Driscoll clip from The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. It's one of the clips that went viral when he talked about his ministry as a bus running people over, and if he had his way, there's going to be a mountain of bodies behind his bus. So Jono was a part of his church network, started off sharing her story and stories of others. And it's expanded to folks in other church circles where personality and profit and growth have kind of just run over people. So I really appreciate what she's doing and I appreciate her heart. Yeah, her show and her ministry deals with very hard and difficult topics. But from my perspective, everything I've seen, it comes from a place of love for the people who are harmed by it not trying to just take shots at the church or things like that. So I've, I've really appreciated her ministry. I'm excited to share this with you. And, and once again, I feel like there may be a lot of encouragement for folks who are disillusioned with the church, with religion, with God, with the Bible, folks who have been harmed so deeply by the people who taught them about the Bible or people who taught them about the character of God. And, just seeing how real life doesn't match up with what they were taught. I think there'll be a lot of encouragement here for folks like that. So um, without further ado, here is Jonna. Well, Jonna, welcome to The Substance. I've been, uh, I feel like it's been a long time coming, sort of. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be here and finally get to talk with you outside of DMs or Twitter conversations. <laughs> right? Yeah. So... Bo uh, the Bodies Behind the Bus podcast. I think that when you were launching that, that's probably where we got connected, I'm guessing, uh, 2021, 2022 or so. Yeah, I was trying to think back today, like what was the initial conversation we had? Like, how did we connect? I, I don't, I know it was something to do with podcasting, but sure. I don't, maybe I even, don't I was like, maybe it was even a hashtag. I don't recall. Yeah, but we did, we connected and I listened to, a couple of your episodes probably about a year ago. And then from there, we've kind of just built a little bit of a friendship. No. So yeah, very, very grateful for you and your ministry. And for the listeners yeah. who may not be aware, give it as little or as long of uh, a history as you like. You, cool. your story, how you got into podcasting and kind of, <laughs> I, I definitely have a few specific questions, but kind of tell briefly kind of your story and how you kind of entered the the public Christian uh, platform world. Cool. Well, first off, again, thank you for having me. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you have done and your former co-hosts. I love the idea of having a space where you can ask questions and be curious. I think that's really beautiful and really needed in the church today. So thank you for what you do. And now for what we do. <laughs> it's kind of, I guess it, it could kind of fit in a similar category, but it's definitely a little bit of a different vibe. Uh, Bodies Behind the Bus is a podcast that was created to platform survivors from within the church or church organizations, their stories. So basically what we do on a weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, depending on how we're doing emotionally basis. Is, you know how that goes. Yeah. Is uh, we have a different storyteller on. We'll usually spend months with them prepping and they will share their story of abuse within the evangelical church. Um, we started really focused on the Acts 29 network. That's where I came from and where Jay and I experienced our own story of abuse. 
spiritual abuse. I was on a staff in an Acts 29 church as the worship leader. I headed up the worship department, um, which is already unique for the fact that I'm a woman in an Acts 29 church doing that. Um, but I, I was, it was so confusing to experience. And I think over a long period of time of my life, just all of these things started to click into place. Like, wait a second, what if everything I've believed about church structure, about um, authority from spiritual leaders, what if all of that has been just kind of like this soup of coercive, abusive garbage, and it's not Jesus? And so from that, my co-host and I, Jay, we we launched this podcast kind of as a, we don't want to blow up any one person, but we want these stories to be heard because there's a systemic issue happening. And you can maybe write it off if it's just me and my story with my boss and my pastor, but can you write it off when we're now, I think we're in the 50s of episodes in, can you write off 50 stories where it sounds like you're reading out of a playbook? And my answer is no. I don't know what the answer is going to be like widespread in the evangelical church, but that's kind of our mission is stories can change, can create change. So th- this is something I want to look into. It was interesting for me. Obviously, you guys hit a nerve, but one of the things I always look at when I am listening to a podcast or checking it out, whether it's new or I haven't listened in a while, I looked at your ratings today and I'm like, <laughs> oh man, she's got <laughs> hundreds of ratings. Like, good for her. Like, and she just started on her own with a buddy. And then I was like, oh, a lot of these are one stars also. <laughs> but you guys have over, you guys got a 4.1 currently. So that was encouraging. We're but I mean, what's it floor. like as, as an individual? And like, so I felt a little bit of kinship with you in that with the substance, we've said this a lot of times before, and we even just previously said this kind of going into our, our, new, our new era, our 3.0 era with me and our editor, Dave, kind of being the main guys doing it right now. Like the goal isn't to just be like, here's Philip's platform where Philip's ideas are promoted and blah, blah, blah. Like the spotlight is shown on me. And like, it, it's truly to help community, give different people good resources, stuff like that. And with you guys, you're truly trying to give folks a a platform to share their stories to commiserate to find encouragement i thought i thought this was really interesting one of your your recent one star reviews uh (laughs) this is a sentence in it it seems like you guys are giving a platform for one person with a grievance to speak out in public and i was like yeah yeah Yeah. that's (laughs) so, so speak to that a little bit like when you get the criticism and i understand obviously trying to read the best thing into something like that. You kind of know what they're getting at, but in a world of systems and structures, and even like with an Acts 29, like a, a parachurch organization that gives some people so much power, like why is it important to give individuals who have been harmed by those systems a voice? Right. Wow. I mean, if anybody just wants like a casual, funny thing to do in the afternoon, go read our reviews because they are <laughs> wild. It is I read a, very, a lot of them today. They're very it's... polarized. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I will say, especially at the beginning, but still now, if someone, almost every time a storyteller puts out a story, we'll at least get one or two one star reviews. Uh, people don't don't like to be uncomfortable. They really don't like to be uncomfortable. And these stories, you can listen to any one episode and you're going to be very uncomfortable listening. It's not something comfortable. It's not a feel good podcast to listen to. These are hard stories. Well, no, that's true. Like every now and then we engage and I feel bad because I was like, oh man, I haven't listened to the last several episodes because whenever you do listen, it's, it's heavy stuff to sit with, right? Yeah. And every once in a while we get someone who's like, man, I just binged like 17 episodes and I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe like one of the uh, online counseling services can use that. Like if you've listened to 10 episodes of Bodies Behind the Bus, you get like a free session. You get like a sponsorship partner in there. Seriously. But I mean, truly, we are so conditioned as a society, I think in particular in the church, to put our ideas of doctrine and theology and um, system 
above like the Imago Day or the just the hum- human aspect, the connection aspect. And we had on a friend, or maybe I was just talking to her on the phone. She's awesome. Go follow her on Twitter if you're not. Her name's Lori Adams Brown. I was talking to her about stories, and she was telling me that like there the empathy response when you're hearing a story you actually put yourself in that person's shoes. Like that's what our brains do, which is fascinating to me. Yes. And so it's important for us to to grapple with and just bear witness to the stories like we have on our podcast because we need to understand what it is to experience that and then we need to do better. So I will say all the time, like if you're a survivor, a lot of survivors find um, a lot of comfort listening to these stories because – it's like this catch 22 where you don't want anyone to go through anything you've been through when it, when you're a survivor, like, no, I don't want anyone else to experience this. But then at the same time, it's like, I'm not alone. I'm not a, a lot of times people will say I felt crazy. I'm not crazy. Like this was what happened to me and it wasn't okay. Um, but I do say a lot, like my ideal audience is I would love for every pastor to be listening to bodies behind the bus. Like, I think it's, vital for the church to cont- if we're going to continue at all in America to start sitting and bearing witness to these stories. And I'll tell you, I I just recently talked to a pastor and they're like, well, are you worried that like you're not talking about the good things the church does? And I was like, no, like I'm not. It's not my job to do PR for the church. Truly. It's not like I'm not scared to tell the truth about abuse in the church. And it's not the storyteller's responsibility for doing PR for the people who hurt them, you know, like the goal here is to raise awareness and to, to bear witness and to hopefully heal and move forward. Going back, reading through some of the stories, listening through to prepare for this. One of the things I was struck by, it was mentioned a few times uh, and and at the substance here, like I, I love the church. I know my previous, like we love, the church as like God had intended it, like mm-hmm. fellowship of the saints is necessary almost as like, it's not quite on the level of like food, water and shelter, but we're, we're not just like being embodied spiritual beings. We need to be around each other. Like the image of the body that Paul talks about, like we, we have different giftings that just when we are around each other, in worship, in prayer, in mercy ministries, in our various communities, like when we rub shoulders with other brothers and sisters, like that that's fellowship, not just sitting around and talking about like your kids or sports or whatever, like fellowship, like doing the one another's of scripture together fills us spiritually in a way that we can't, if we're just listening to podcasts or live streaming Sunday mornings or stuff like that. And not to say that there aren't obviously circumstances where people are stuck doing those because of various things. Or even now, like I know a lot of people with various church hurts, like I'm not trying to push them back into Mm -hmm. that right away, but I mean, we, we need the body. So I I love that you said (laughs) pastors are somebody who you would love to listen. So all that to say, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about something. I heard you talk on the show, you and Jay, like the, the shepherd versus King, model of pastor. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Gosh, well, you know, what we've found, and we have branched out from Acts 29 um, somewhat. So we've done some missions orgs, some SB, and really it's all kind of like the same, to be honest. It's this idea that, that it's a CEO model of church and structure, yeah. but really what it comes down to, and I know I mentioned this a few times on the show, is that when you see like a real life shepherd, they're like dirty, they're covered in blood and mud and all sorts of gross stuff. I mean, you're, I don't know (laughs) if you've ever watched videos of like trying to herd sheep, but it is wild. Like that's a wild job. It's not glamorous. It's smelly and gross, you know, but it's needed. If there's not a shepherd there, if there's not someone protecting those sheep, then they're prey. Um, And I think what we've done in America in particular, especially white America, is we've built platforms for our faith leaders uh, that look way more glamorous and king-like. It's authoritarian. We've, We've really valued that structure. 
we're we're putting value on numbers. We're putting values on putting butts in seats. And it doesn't matter if people are walking out the back door as long as two in their place are walking in and sitting in the seats. And really, it's it's a frustrating cycle to witness from where I sit because I'm seeing the the fallout. I'm seeing the victims of this. Uh, but really, like pastors are also a victim in this cycle because what's happening is they're being put on these platforms where they're where, where perfection is expected and perfection is unattainable. So when there is not perfection, they are not given the space to own when they mess up. So there's not actually room for real repentance and repair in the systems that we've built. And I think, I mean, I think a lot of that comes down to just this complete disconnect from what being a shepherd pastor is versus what we created it into being. I mean, the, the name of your show and the opening audio, I think most of the our generation of Christians and a lot of people in the podcasting community, we all kind of listened in horror and interest when the uh, the Mars Hill podcast came yeah. out. And actually, I think on our our new top ten, which may or may not be published because we're we're working on it, <laughs> I'm pretty sure our episode on the recap, yeah, the lessons uh, from the Mars Hill. That's one of our top mm-hmm. ten all time downloaded episodes. Um, we, we all listen to that with interest and horror and recognition a lot of us who grew up in the evangelical spaces so i mean hearing that every time before the episode is just chilling like with glee mark driscoll was talking about like desiring a mountain of bodies behind the mars hill bus and in his in his schema of things like that would show success like the amount of people who didn't fit with their their vision, what whatever it was they were trying to do to be successful, like he could be like, oh, see all those people who like we ran over, like they couldn't ride along with like our success. Like that's yeah. just such a wild thing, but also very like very inappropriate, like wicked, but also very accurate to a lot of evangelical Christianity. Yeah, and think about Anybody that's been in a ministry environment that's listening will have heard like, oh, they're a problem person or like, oh, thank God they finally left. They were a problem person. And that's not to say that there's not there's a little bit of grace, right? Like it is hard work to be around hard things all the time and and, and being in ministry should be being around hard things. Um, But I think that kind of just speaks to that is so widely accepted as something that we we see in ministry is this idea of the problem person. And a lot of times, like those squeaky wheels have a reason for being squeaky. And we're just conditioned to be to wanting the next step towards, like you said, success that we're willing to run over throw out throw out the bus door the person that seems like they're getting in the way or that's going to maybe mean a pit stop and then kind of celebrate it too right well in the places i come from acts 29 i mean the reason we a huge reason that we do the podcast is because those core values are the core of what we came from like anyone that is listening now or that has attended an acts 29 church like this is what our leaders were in. This is what they were discipled in. I mean, the 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 current president of Acts 29 100% was sitting there when that happened, uh, that Driscoll speech. And the former president of Acts 29 was also there and came on stage during that, what are they called, when pastors all come together conference. So it's like these dudes that are still running the network, like they might have like a gentler cadence to their voice, but they even have been discipled in and steeped in this same garbage yeah that's how they've been formed like those are the under that's the foundation of that particular like ministry yeah and i mean it's we call it the like punk rock little brother or um like son of the sbc it's all the same you know it's really it's really the foundation of most of white american evangelicalism over the the last couple of decades like you hear notable pastors some who 
have more uh, public dignity than others, like we'll at least give lip service to that, right? Going like, hey, like we shouldn't be formed. Like a church shouldn't be like an organization. Pastor shouldn't be CEO. But then functionally, like it's really hard to escape that model for us. What? What? Any any thoughts on why you think that might be? I have a lot of uncomplete not complete thoughts around why I think that might be like unformed full thoughts. But I mean, a conversation that Jay and I have been having and I've been having with um, actually one of our storytellers is like the characteristics of, of the church that, and these networks and these denominations, like, what are they? It's like being deceitful, uh, judgmental, evil, like, all of these horrific descriptors are what you see or your main thought when you think of some of these networks or these churches or institutions. And that just freaks me out <laughs> that they are claiming the name of God, yet the characteristics are the name or are Satan, you know, like that's not God's character. So what does that mean? I don't know. Like, I don't know if we've just missed the mark so much at this point. I don't know if it's going to look like, I mean, a lot of people like Chuck DeGroat, we had him on and he's, he wrote, he's amazing and wrote when narcissism comes to church. And yeah, um, he was saying he thinks when he's um, like in a nursing home one day, we're going to be like meeting with him there and we're all going to be talking about, thankfully, this reckoning is now starting. Like we're just starting to see like a <laughs> tiny bit of fruit hey. and like, that's so exhausting. Right. But the truth is, is like, it is. <sighs> It's so vast. I I don't even, I don't know where that thought was going. It's just, it's scary. Like, is everything going to have to crumble? And I know that sounds dark, but I I almost wonder is, are all these systems, are all these structures going to have to crumble for us to get to the heart of God in our ministries? And that, that specific thought is something that has obviously occurred to me. I've had that conversation with others in my life and it's, it's not something I necessarily am desiring or praying towards or what have you, but also like you, I go like my, and it's so wild how the, the practice and some of the pragmatism differs from what we've at least given lip service to is the underlying theology, right? Like if, if we're still in the believing camp, like God is good, God is sovereign. He is, he is timeless. Like obviously he uses us, but like, in, in the under the umbrella of like God being sovereign, like we we matter, but we're also not like it's not all about us. So like, would it be the worst thing? Like we're so self centered, <laughs> we'd be like, well, how could the kingdom work possibly exist if like we we stopped? And like we're so it, it can be easy. I don't want to paint too broadly, but it can be easy in in the culture that is so used to being centered. Where it's like, if we're not the ones running the show, like, how could gospel work possibly still go on? And it's like, uh, guys, didn't start with us. Uh, if if we if humanity continues to be here, it's not going to end with us. So like, we should want to just play our part as well as we can while we're around, right? But that's yeah. that that's not exactly functionally what it, what seems to be driving it. And I think being faithful looks can sometimes look like tearing down things that are not of God that are claiming to be of God. Like I, we talk a lot, like I'm in, I talk a lot in this like idea of like burn it down, (laughs) but I don't mean like burn down everything. I do think that there is a place for like holy fire to burn away the garbage, burn away things that are not of God. And I think something that we, that I'll speak for myself, not a we, something I have struggled with coming out of, um, I was in, I I call it reformed, but it's not necessarily reformed theology. It's more like neo-Calvinist reformed, Acts 29, SBC-ish world adjacent. And a lot of like, a lot of the people who I know personally that are active members in this community, many of them share that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, so they might relate to this then I'm coming out of that and I'm like, what is like, I'm actually excited. It's been painful, but I am excited for where I'm at in my journey where I'm, 
I am looking at the Bible differently. I'm lo- looking at my doctrines and theologies and beliefs differently and saying, God, where are you at in this? What are you trying to teach me? And like, what are things that I was just believing to believe it because somebody that I thought I was supposed to give that authority to told me I had to believe it in order to be like in good standing as a member at my church? Like, what what do I really believe? Where are you at, God? And it's made a huge difference in my relationship with God. I see him much bigger than I ever have in my life. I think there's a lot more room for mystery and curiosity and wonder than there ever was. And and a huge part of that was the fear that was associated with asking questions. Rightfully so. It is not safe in many of these contexts to ask questions. You will Because of how they're built, right? Yeah. Questions yeah. are dangerous. And if you're choosing <laughs> systems, if you're choosing systems over people, well, yeah, for, for a year and a half, the substance was stalled on episode 12 because of just that. <laughs> we were How like, oh, we're going to be one of those podcasts that uh, only gets like 10 or 12 episodes out and then quits. But yeah, How no, dare you. very familiar with that. Gosh. Well, you said some stuff that I want to talk about. But yeah. before we get on to that, I, I just want to backpedal while we're in the, the burn it down part of the conversation. Like yeah. that is not unbiblical necessarily either. Like you look at, I, I, I regularly think of Malachi 1 partially because of the uh, Shy Lin song, but like it, it's a, a deeply, it can be both deeply distressing because like you said, change and fear and all that, but also very hopeful. Like the prophet says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple door so that you would not light l- useless fires on my altar. Like bad churches do not glorify the Lord. Like I always like also go with the, the Pauline thing of whether in pretense or in truth, like, if any of these bad places do any good, I'm grateful for the good. But that doesn't mean that like these bad places shouldn't be held accountable and or shut down. You cannot love something and allow it to continue to be destructive. I just I so firmly believe that like if you love the church, you will say something if you see destructive behavior, if you see abuse, if you see sin, you'll say it because you love it. And that's really been profound. And at points where I thought I maybe could even lose my faith, seeing storytellers come on the podcast and choose integrity has truly kept kept me afloat at points. Like I, we talk a lot about like carrying hope for one another. And I think that's even going way back to when you were talking about loving the church, like that is a huge part of the church is having community to carry hope when you don't have it. And yes, with this work, it can be really daunting and it can feel really hopeless a lot of the time. Um, And I guess this kind of even goes back to a prior question you asked, but I don't know where Jesus is at in all of this when it comes to the systems or the buildings or the individual congregations. But I can tell you, I see him in these storytellers. Like I see him. And so I don't know if the church is going to look like these individual congregations or sometimes I, I'm I'm redefining what even the church looks like for me right now because I'm not. It's so hard to reconcile a lot of the stuff that we're seeing right now. No, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, Austin Fisher was on the show. I don't know. I think in the 80s or 90s of episodes, he wrote a book called Faith in the Shadows that was absolutely about this. I loved it. Him sharing his story of just what you said, the part of the fellowship of the saints for him was even as somebody who was like engaged in active ministry work, like leaning on the faith of the brothers and sisters around him when he was having a hard time because of various things. Because it's like life is hard enough on his own when you don't have the people who should be your spiritual fathers and mothers and leaders and shepherds like harming you. And the wild thing is like, I've had some conversations with people. I know some people who have kind of written snide remarks about some of the stuff we talk about on the show. You don't need to intend to harm somebody mm-hmm. to harm them, yep. right? Like, and and again, we, we talk about this a lot on the show. It's so, one of my greatest frustrations is people who are unable, who refuse to, not interested in looking at things systemically because a lot of times, I'm not saying 
oh, these are wicked men. These are, it's not all a bunch of horrible narcissists, but the, the systems that they have adopted and built and kind of exchanged the, the servant leader model for the CEO king model, like that model creates like that, that model, like the bodies behind the bus speech, mm -hmm. like that model, like in order to sustain it and for it to be successful, you need growth. You need numbers. One of the things that I love that one of your guests talked about, I wrote it down is that the church isn't about efficiency. And I was like, like, it's about messy people being in relationship, seeking to be better versions of themselves, to love their neighbors and to be a light to the world. Like how one of my greatest distresses with all these things publicly, I'm so glad that these stories are being told, but you're like, man, like why are these people in ministries? Like it's so, so heartbreaking that, Many people in the world, when they think of like, what is church? What is religion? What is being a follower of God look like in the Christian sense? It's these people who are running these organizations that are mm -hmm. just gleefully running over people for what? Like material gain, more greater influence. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's a travesty. I mean, yeah. And the, the, a lot of the pastors that, I know in these stories are making like double what CEOs in the rest of the world are making Oof. and it, like, and then a big question that we'll get often is like, well, what are they going to do? Like if we'll say they're disqualified for ministry, they're a danger to those in the flock. They are unhealthy. The best thing for them, the best thing for the flock is for them to not be in spiritual authority right now. They have, they should not be in an authority position. Uh, it's what are they going to do? They can't go get a job. So now we're stuck in, we're caring more about the trajectory of these career paths and this unsustainable salary amount that many of these people are getting. They're never <laughs> going to find it somewhere else. <laughs> oh, Jonna, think of the career prospects of the abuser. Yeah, truly. That's like a huge, huge comment that we get back. Well, and that's all. I mean, on a side note, that's also just an interesting kind of admission in a way because it's like we know that a lot of these men would not be successful out in the world if they didn't have the system and the structures of like a personality driven church like the religious language and power like the mm -hmm. spiritual and religious power of a church like that that they kind of lean on and borrow from to kind of prop up maybe some of the narcissism or some of the the personality driven like desires that they have like there's like that wouldn't work if you were starting a business or even if you got like a c level job at a company you couldn't operate that way cuz people aren't just going to be like oh like he's the man of god like i'm just going to unquestionably execute his agenda like you're going oh, yeah, to have like to be hr rules <laughs> yeah you're going <laughs> to have to be a team player you're going to have to produce something of value mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to like a lot of the people like don't do ministry a lot of them and i again i'm not saying this as as an outsider or a a, a critic who's just trying to tear down i think the act of preaching is very important but, but preaching is not the sole or primary role of a shepherd right like if you're spending 20 plus hours in sermon prep to I mean, let's say you have multiple services, like if you're prepping all week, if you're spending hours and hours and hours to minister for two or three hours, and that's the, the week's worth of uh, giving that you are doing to your church and the fulfilling of your role, like that's pretty jacked up. Yeah. And what are you teaching? You don't know your flock. Like what, what is the point? What is the purpose? I, I mean, I think that we would do so well to just give up the agenda side of ministry in general. Like we don't have any agenda. Like we're going to, we're okay with, with curveballs. We're okay with knowing our flock today needs to just be with each other. And we do, you miss that when, as you grow, that starts becoming unsustainable. And so that's where these questions come in. Can we like, is there a healthy model? What's next? And 
And I think that there's a lot of people with like good faith efforts trying to figure that out right now. Sure. And I don't know if any of them have. I don't want to be overly or unnecessarily critical, but I mean, we've talked about it before on the show. Like when you get to many services or you get to multiple campuses or satellite churches and it's not people being deeply ministered to on a personal level by men and women that they know, it's every week we sit in front of a screen to have like the CEO pastor give us a talk. Like that's that's not it's not the model that we see if the Bible is our source. That's not what we see anywhere. That can't possibly be justified on biblical grounds. Yeah. And then that's like also why not just listen to a podcast at that? Exactly. Like that It's not fundamentally where... different. Right. So then what's Cuz like the what are you going to do like you're like oh like well that's my pastor. It's like could you call him? Like, if you're sick, is he going to come visit you in the hospital? Like, what do you mean that's your pastor? Like, yeah. a lot of times what you mean is that's the guy I listen to for one hour a week. Like, yep. is that a pastor? Yeah. What are we doing? Like, that is, I ask that all the time. I'm like, what are we doing? I was talking to a friend the other day. We were talking about how this idea of, like, churches being country clubs. And it's, like, a social place. And it, it that's not what we – what are we doing? Like, is that what you – I don't – I'll go – if I – if we could afford it, I would go just join a country club. You know, it's not – I don't want that. I want to be on mission with people. I want to be in community, like rich, spirit-filled community with people. And we're just – we've missed the mark. I know that there are places that are doing it. I'm sure of it, but not – Totally. Not yeah. large scale. So, I mean, what has been kind of shaping – your, I mean, feel free to share with all whatever, like you said that your relationship with God and the Bible and community, are you currently in a church that you're regularly engaging no. with right now? Where are you at? No, unfortunately I've been visiting a church for a few months, but we're probably not going to be continuing there. And it's not what I found is hard. And maybe I'll just speak now to anybody else who's listening that maybe has experienced spiritual abuse or been in, in a spiritually coercive or manipulative church environment. I really have realized I need to be somewhere where I feel safe. I don't have to agree, but I need to feel safe and I need to feel like my soul is safe. <laughs> yeah. And this is going to sound very bleak, but it's very rare that that is in existence within many churches in America. And again, I'm saying America because that's my, what I know. I'm not visiting churches in other parts of the world right now to be able to speak to that. So this might be actually, in fact, I know it's happening internationally because we get emails from people outside of the United States too. But this is why I really want pastors to listen to bodies behind the bus because being tone deaf on this issue is actively keeping survivors out of your church because this is not an exaggeration many of us will have a panic attack in the parking lot and we can't walk in we're sitting there and we hear a hillsong song and yeah <laughs> you want to vomit and you think like me being here and sitting with this song playing right now means that like i'm I start feeling complicit in what other people that experienced abuse like I experienced, experienced. You know, it's like this collective grief and lament and trauma. And so it's really, it's really hard to walk into a church and not feel like you're co-signing something. Well, I've heard you mention too uh, on the show, and this is a conversation I've had with many people who I know and love. That And I mean, frankly, I'll be completely honest. I wasn't trying to leave myself out of this. I've experienced this too, where mm -hmm. it can be really challenging. Like, I love the Bible. Mm -hmm. Like, I have spent decades reading it, studying it, uh, my memorizing of it as not <laughs> kept up lately. But like, that is something I love and want to like deeply know and be formed by. Man, like post a number of different things that happened in 2020, it's been challenging mm. to like crack it open and spend good time with it. I'm so grateful for audio Bibles. Mm -hmm. I love the preaching at my church. I love preaching and, and good podcasts, but like it has been challenging. And I know you've shared that as well. Where, mm -hmm. what are, I mean, maybe talk about a little bit your journey. What, have you found any encouragement there? What encouragement would you share with folks who are having a hard time going like, 
I, I think I still believe that it's good for me, but it's hard. There, have you ever heard of Common Hymn? Yes. They're great. They write a ton of music. It's like a collaboration of artists. And there's a song called He Has Time. And it was specifically written for sexual assault survivors. Um, and the whole refrain of it is he is here. He has time to take what's wrong and make it right. Like God's not in a rush with you. Um, and that has been, well, one, some of the only worship music I can listen to. And that has me over time, but especially right at the beginning. We really want things to be a quick fix. And it's just not. And especially we're still learning so much about religious trauma and it's been so crapped on in the church. This idea of like trauma, I'm using air quotes right now. Like sure. Like, oh, like what are you going to do? Go to therapy? Yeah. Go cry yeah. about it. But truly like the, the research that's coming out, like people respond their our bodies and our minds are forever shaped and changed because of this experience because what's happening in these moments is the very voice of God is being used to tell you you are dirt, you are worthless, or you're not good enough, or you're not loved if you're that. And it takes a lot of time to pull those pieces apart to see that that person that was weaponizing God is not God. And there's no easy quick way to do that and and that's was my experience with the bible just opening the bible a big help for me has been changing translations i was like full full on esv acts 29 girl sure <laughs> like this is the best translation and now it's like i i do spend a lot of time in the niv to be honest which i was raised in um a macarthur-esque church oh man i got I just, I, mo- I just moved. I moved over a year ago. I'm in the basement. I got, I got boxes of MacArthur books over here that I haven't gotten rid of yet. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm like, what do I do with these? I like, burn them. <laughs> that, it's like, do I want to sell them and give them to somebody else? Do they like, no, nope. do they have something like, what do I like? I've, I've had that thought multiple times. Like, yeah. what do I do with these? Yeah. So like Acts 29 was like <laughs> progressive for me. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I remember when Driscoll hit, I was like, yeah. oh, like he's not like these other guys. He says the hard stuff. What's so funny is he just says the same crap, just like in he was wearing skinny jeans when he did it. You know, it's totally. like, what the heck? But yeah, changing. I was so. Oh yeah, I was saying that because NIV when I was growing up was like not the best. It was like the like milk versus like the steak version. Of I the I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that analogy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's been a big help. But you know, a lot of it's just time and having learning to have grace for myself, therapy, going to therapy has been extremely important. Something I've learned in myself, like I do not want to be a fundamentalist. I don't want to be a fundamentalist on any part of the scale. And that a lot of times when you're leaving a a fundamentalist conservative space, you find the most comfort in a fundamentalist progressive space. If you're used to living your life in a box that's black and white and that you know exactly what's expected of you and exactly Or here what- are the answers to these questions. Here are our positions that mm-hmm. this is – these are the pillars. You just yep. switch a new set of pillars out. like Exactly. But that's not how God created us. He created us with nuance and beauty and a lot of mystery. and <laughs> <laughs> And so I've been like working really hard on – exposing those parts of myself that are still trying to be a fundamentalist outside of the conservative side that I've been in. And my therapist a few weeks ago looked at me and was like, I'm so proud of you for the work you've done in like rooting out fundamentalism in yourself in regards to all these things. But have you realized that you have it towards yourself? Like you're a Hmm. fundamentalist with yourself. And you have this like rubric that like you have to be perfect. And you if you step out of lock with any in any space, like there's no room for you to mess up. If you mess up, then every part of you is invalidated. And that's truly been baked into me (laughs) in my religious upbringing, to be honest. But, you know, that that's where I'm at in my journey is like, Oh, wait a second. I can even like get to the point and do all this hard work and all these spaces to have more grace and compassion and empathy for people all over the spectrum. Yet 
now I have to turn it inward and I have to see myself as like a, a child of God and Imago Day. So it take it takes time. That's going to take a lifetime probably. No, I think not being a fundamentalist with yourself, that is, that's a word right there. And I think that like, that's hard to not do period, right? Because like, there is something comforting about either certainty or the illusion of certainty, right? Mm -hmm. Like we go, here are the answers. Like whenever I get worried or whenever I get anxious, like this is it. These are the hard answers. And I think that really when we go beyond just a, a couple of very basic things, like religious propositions, like here, and, and I have this conversation with so many people who are on so many different sides of it. I'm like, look, I think it's very important. Like the substance, we've got 120, 130, whatever episodes. Like we can like our, our little tagline, engaging the culture without the culture war. We think this is important, but the things that are truly essential, man, like there's not going to be a quiz. Like you're not going to have a, a political or cultural or even theological quiz when you die. Like being a child of God is, is simple. Like the, the, the faith of a child and the trust in God to do the things you cannot do. That's very simple, mm -hmm. right? But we like to add on all these other things and then judge the other people who are outside of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Outside of it. And then that's what is so freaking infuriating about abuse within the church, right? <laughs> it's like we get in these camps and then it's like super exciting I don't know if exciting is the right word, but that's kind of the vibe, right? To like be better than the other camp sure. or to, to know God better or to have the re correct doctrine or the correct theology. Like we're actually doing it right. Yet on the inside, we're burning down. We're, we're literally running over people. We have crazy sexual abuse crisis happening in our own camps. You know, it's like we can't get the logs out of our own eyes. Well, yeah. And I mean, and one of the things Trevor, Trevor and I bumped up with a ton in, in the show previously is like folks in white spaces who just re refuse to even have the conversation of systemic injustice or even like we've had Jamar Tisby and Justin Gibney and various folks on the show, like even just a very basic understanding of the facts of history, like just starting there with the reality of what has happened like culturally, nationally, and in so many ways, what has happened with biblical language, like God-centered language that justified all these things. And we're like, hey, uh, we should look at some of these things. And then just the the impossibility of progress in so many spaces there too. Like it, it's hard. It, it, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. I mean, we see it in the spiritual abuse survivor community too, especially with race stuff. Like we like to center the white experience. And that's not to say that white stories are not equally worthy. Like all of our stories matter and all of us matter because we are all image bearers. But it's not like spiritual abuse is new. It's not like so-and-so white person who wrote a book all of a sudden created this word like spiritual abuse. Like we can go all the way back throughout the entirety of human history and see spiritual abuse happening. We see it happening in the Bible, but we've like accepted this colonial view of of what it even looks like to heal from spiritual abuse from most of these white spaces like that is some deep work that we should want to do as believers but our faith expressions our religious context that's a foundation in many of them is supremacy so totally and i mean and that's a thing that i know is a barrier for both brown and black folks and white folks who, I mean, 2016 to 2020 was an interesting time, but then 2020 on has just been so wild to live through. And I mean, I know a lot of white folks who are beginning to kind of see some of these things and then they want to learn, they want to help, they want to educate themselves, they want to help, they want to build relationships. And then they are finding the white spaces that they have been in a lot of times, the ones that have given them their view of God and have taught them the faith, they're finding it's not compatible to make mm -hmm. racial progress there. And I know a lot of people have had a, a terrible time with that. And like, 
and I've had a hard time too going just like, yeah, it's bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like these systems are, 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 are not good. It doesn't mean that everything's bad. It doesn't mean that God isn't true. It doesn't mean that the Bible is not true or the Bible is just the white man's religion to hold people down. But like it's used that way. Yeah. And you know, what's fascinating is anecdotally, a lot of our stories come surrounding this 2016-20 election cycle and like all yeah, of Yeah, weird how when the church sold out for political power, mm-hmm. how it created a lot of uh, chaos and trauma in its wake. Yeah. And people started asking questions. And, you know, people started asking questions that I don't know that they ever would have had we not been totally. confronted in the way that we were. Um, and so in a very weird way, it gives me hope. Because, yes. again, I see these stories and they got kicked out of their churches. It didn't change the reality, but it, it made a lot of people aware mm-hmm. and it caused so much pain. But like and not to spiritualize it, but I, I agree like good because yeah. that needed to happen. Not like good that people had that pain, but all those underlying things that made so many so-called church leaders quick to support these horrific, undignified, like wicked things, like that was there already. Like 2016 didn't create that. Yep, exactly. And I think that to me is like, okay, that's like a spark. Like that's a good kind of fire, right? So I think we're just starting to see like the baby sparks of whatever this reckoning is going to look like that has been a long time coming. And it has, it would be dis ingenuous to say it hasn't been happening for like the entirety of our country's existence really but you know I think I think we had really gotten to a place in white spaces predominantly white spaces where we're like it's all better that was then this is now and like we're (laughs) you know like all of a sudden you know I mean social media is huge for that it's not just huge we I'm so grateful social media can be very toxic (laughs) I've been on the bad side of social media. I mean, you can I go read our ima- reviews. Like, I feel for you so much, Jonna. Like when I see, Thank you. I just got like, I don't know, like her husband and Jane, whatever community she has. Like, I, I'm so glad that they're, they're taking care of you well. Cause it's like being in this space, trying to help survivors, being a woman, like it's, it's gotta be rugged. Yeah. I don't, God really made me a fiery one. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm existing. I'm still surviving, but it definitely can be hard. Um, well, and you're also raising white and black children. So you have, yeah. I'm sure, people in both communities giving you the side eye as well. Love. Absolutely. It's hard to, it's hard to, there's not a lot of nuance allowed in these spaces. And that's kind of what we were talking about before is like, there's not a lot of room to, there's not a lot of space mess up or to just not know. You don't know what you don't know. And that's kind of even a core value of us at Bodies Behind the Bus. Like people don't know what they don't know. And it's not your fault if you didn't know, but what are you doing now that you know, now that you've been confronted with this hard thing? So I don't doubt for a second that my entire life is going to be me being confronted by parts of myself or my upbringing or my my whiteness that <laughs> that is going to be hard. And that's going to be something that I have to grapple with and work through. But I, I, I do believe that's like part of us all being humans. And I, I was telling you this earlier, like yeah. God was so gracious when we left our church. That lit, like we were looking online, we visited some different places remotely, but literally the first church we went to after we decided, look, as much love as we can, again, bless every good thing that they're doing, blah, blah, blah. This isn't the place for us to grow and we've been there for the last three years and it's been wonderful. And what drew me there is I wanted a truly diverse church. Like yeah. it is a, a very, very um, just completely diverse, not just black, brown, and white, but like you have people who are doing very well, very active in the community, people who are, are economically having a hard time. There are, there are, there's a minority of white pastors, which for me was just kind of nice. Cause I'm like, look, like I know what happens in a lot of those spaces. And it's been, mm-hmm. it's been so nice. Well, when you just, the history of Kansas city, one of the episodes was highlighting specifically how when a church doesn't mirror the environment, like that's maybe a little bit of a red flag. Yeah. I'm so grateful place that truly does. 
any before we do there's one final segment at the end but just kind of wanted to yeah. wrap it up not to force a positive but again encouragement for folks who are disillusioned with the abuse of power talking about like the racial history just how the bible was used to oppress and to harm um all sorts of folks like what at the end of the day, what would be your encouragement for the the disillusioned, the discouraged folk? I can relate. <laughs> You're not alone. And I think I, that kind of goes back to what you're saying when when a survivor hears stories on the podcast and it's kind of like that thing where you're like, dang it, it wasn't just me. But then also it's nice to hear that it's not just you. I think that can apply here too with there is a lot of people that love the Lord that are discouraged and disillusioned right now. And I think that I personally, for myself, attribute that to the Holy Spirit. Like God is moving and God is grieved. And that sat, like lament can be hopeful, like being able to recognize where things are not okay, for me at least, is a hopeful thing. And so I hope that 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 we can all kind of realize like we we can at least start to identify the problems here. And being able to see it is a huge deal. Like the fact that we can even just say that it exists is a big deal. I don't know what comes next, but I do still believe that God is faithful. I don't know if it's going to look as, I know, actually, I can almost 100% say it will not be comfortable, whatever is next. (laughs) Truly. I'm already extremely uncomfortable right now. (laughs) So it's not going to be comfortable, but but there are people that love Jesus that want to see good and that want to see his kingdom here on earth and they're fighting for that. And so you're not alone. And if you need some hope, feel free to DM on Bodies Behind the Bus, follow me on Twitter. It might be a little bit of a wild ride, but <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> enough people have said that and we've had internal talks enough. We really should do an episode on lament. It's not something mm-hmm. that the the Western church has much of an education. I can say I never was given, and I I went to Bible college and seminary, and uh, I was mentored by a lot of different pastors and elders. I hardly got instructed in lament ever in my decades of instruction. We don't know how to be uncomfortable. We don't know how to sit in it. I've said, I had a pastor say, well, what's next? Like It was that same conversation when I said, you know, it's not my job to do PR. For the church, God's got that. Like, I don't have to be the one that does that. I'm not going to lie about it, but I'm going to be honest about things that have gone down on. Or- well, because the insinuation, and again, sorry, if yeah, not trying to go too long here. I, I recently had another conversation where somebody was getting fired up about public coverage of Christian, so-called Christian wrongdoing. And it's like, ah, oh, like these people are trying to give us a bad name. And it's like, like, really? Like if, if people who are claiming the name of Christ do bad things, isn't it really, really good Mm -hmm. to shine a light on that and call it out? Because if we don't, then we give like the world in quotes, like then we give them like, then we admit like, yeah, if we're not calling that out, shining a light on the darkness and saying, this is wicked and like antithetical to the God I'm trying to serve like Mm -hmm. then yeah we're basically admitting like yeah this bad stuff like this is this goes with it it's the mafia like truly it feels like we're like a mafia organization if not oh boy gross (laughs) I could tell you some off-air stories that were (laughs) we we have had like similar like this is kind of like that a little bit (laughs) yeah like you yep you gotta rub shoulders with the right people and you can't say the wrong things to the right people or are you loyal to the pastors here unity don't 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 be divisive yeah um what one thing that pastor said was like well what do you do next like are you just letting people just sit here and that's actually some of the critique we get sometimes in our reviews it's like but, but what's next and i said like we're not trying to move to what's next we're just at the beginning right now What's next? Like, we're going to sit here and we might have to sit here for years because we've been running over people. The church has been running over people. And now it's time to take stock of all the people that we've lost and the bodies in the background of the bus. Well, John, I'm very, very encouraged um, by you and your platform and your ministry. 
And before I let you go here, uh, we like to do one segment called Substance Shoutouts. So this can be spiritual and super encouraging, or this can be fun. What have you been watching, reading, listening to, intaking that has been encouraging, edifying, enjoyable? What's what's on your playlist? What's on your Netflix queue? What have you been enjoying lately that you would like to uh, recommend to folks? Well, I mean, obviously, does every single guest say Ted Lasso? That's like my like comfort show. Up. Have you finished it yet, or are you? I have savoring finished. It? I'm very so sad. Bad. I'm still like holding on to hope that something, some spinoff will happen. I think they're clearly going to spin it off. I, I like the idea of beginning, middle, and end, but I do think yeah. they could have absolutely done one more season and kept it. But also, the ending was beautiful and made me cry as well. Yeah, I was really really sad that we didn't get like goofy ted at all but like it also made sense in his i thought it was actually really well written but a lot of people didn't like that um i my kansas city's own jason sudeikis come on the show claim to fame he should come on the show that would be i'm trying have you ever seen his movie and this is again another side note his movie colossal no very interesting movie about trauma him and ann hache if it's it's r-rated it's a little bit rugged but I'd say if you have any interest in it, don't don't read about it. Just check it out. It's a, a, a bizarre and very fascinating movie that I would love to get him on to talk about. I'll have to check that out. That sounds fascinating. I'll say the newest Muse album has been like my inspo track for the last six months of my life. I don't. It is interesting if you're coming out of like a religious space that was like very high, high control. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting album. Nice. Um and usually that's like if I feel like I need something, if I'm feeling like really down or I have to like get some hours in for the podcast, that's like what I'll throw on to amp myself up. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, Ted Lasso and Muse, I'll be throwing those in the show notes and uh, listeners go check those out. It is interesting that a lot of the nostalgia bands who come back do put out a lot of content in that in that kind of arena. It's It's very interesting. I know. I think a lot of, I don't know if this was about religion or not, this album, but it just feels like it is because of the world I'm in. But I think a lot of like the nostalgic bands that are like our age were raised similar to us. A lot of them were. Yeah, totally. So many of us are having this experience right now that's like, what is happening? Every part of my life that I thought was foundational in my faith feels like it's being shaken right now. So a lot of good art coming out, but totally. Good Lord, our generation, we're feeling it right now. Jonna, thank you so much for coming. Um, Look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate your work. Thank you for having me and thank you for the work you're doing. And hopefully we can take a page out of Ted Lasso's book and staying curious. What a great conversation between Phil and Jonna. I'm sure you enjoyed it. It really just, I think, encapsulates what Phil and I talked about uh, two weeks ago. The importance of stories, telling our stories, sharing our stories, and the way that that helps us hold on to optimism, even in the midst of trauma. So love the work that John is doing over at Behind the Bus Pod. Make sure you follow them. If this conversation or conversations like this are valuable to you, if you appreciate them, then I would encourage you to become a supporter of the Substance Podcast to make sure that this work can keep happening. Phil loves doing this. I love doing this, uh, but financial support can make sure that we can keep doing this. We can keep improving the quality of the episodes as well. So you can head to either of the links in the show notes where you can become a monthly subscriber at five to $10. Again, Phil and I are working towards having some perks available for those who are monthly subscribers. But if that's not your thing, uh, being able to give monthly, but you want to give a one time, then you can hit us up on Cash App and either of those would be much, much appreciated. Be sure that you're following at The Substance on social media to keep up with everything that's going on. Outside of supporting us financially, the next biggest thing that you could do for us is just share this podcast, whether it's on your own social media feed or with someone who you know who would appreciate this episode, someone who's maybe been struggling with the power dynamics of church or getting back into church or who has gone through their own church hurt experience. They might benefit from this. And so send this over to them so that they can give it a listen. We would much appreciate that. This is Editor Dave saying thank you for listening and make sure you tune in next time for the next episode of The Substance.
Dave, you can cut this out. Thank you so much for coming on last minute so that we could get an episode out.